doing a chart lesson this morning. We do one every, every two months or so. And uh, what those are, are descriptions of what the Bible teaches from one cover to the other. And so we do them so frequently because we as Christians should be aware of what the Bible says and what the main points are. And uh, you should be doing that through your own reading and through your own studies as well. Uh, but it, getting it in just an hour or an hour and 15 minutes as sometimes it goes um, is helpful. Uh, to see what the Bible says just in one going. So this morning I want to try uh, more than one chart lesson. I'm going to do multiple chart lessons in one hour. So we'll, I'm pressing my limits here a little bit. Uh, I want to talk about what the Bible says from beginning to end. And there's three things I want to deal with today. One, he, the Bible talks about a nation. It talks about a promise given to that nation uh, that it would be a blessing to the other nations and that God's kingdom would come to the earth and reign Forever. And so talk, this theme is throughout the scripture of this nation and this kingdom. And this is the subject of prophecy primarily. It also speaks about a man, a God, who becomes a man in Jesus Christ, the Messiah. And from cover to cover it speaks about this Savior, uh, this King, this Messiah. And then thirdly, yeah, we're going to talk about the body of Christ, which it doesn't talk about from cover to cover. Uh, but it does talk about in the Bible, so we need to put it on our chart lesson. And we'll see where that fits in hopefully today under the theme uh, that we deal with. So, the Bible speaks about a nation of God's people. And uh, if you look at Genesis chapter 12, which we so often begin with in our chart lessons, you'll see the seed of where this nation began with Abraham. Just recently, uh, there was an accord struck between Israel and the United Arab Emirates, uh, and they called it the Abraham Accord. You've seen that in the news, perhaps. Uh, they called it that because they were trying to unite three different Abrahamic religions. Have you heard that term before, Abrahamic religions? Say, well, Abrahamic religions, what's that? Religions that all claim to go back to Abraham. Uh, Abraham was promised, remember, by God to be a father of many nations. And there are three religions in the world, sociologically speaking, that uh, all agree with that. Uh, Christianity, Judaism, and Islam all trace their origins back to Abraham. If you go any further than that, they kind of divide a little bit, you know, on what they say happened. But in Genesis chapter 12, it says, The Lord had said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country, and from thy kindred, and from thy father's house, unto a land that I will show thee. I will make of thee a great nation, and I will bless thee, and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. And I will bless them that bless thee, curse him that curseth thee, and in thee shall all the families of the earth be blessed. And so back in Genesis 12, we get this promise of a nation. That would be above the nations. And so I'm going to draw just a city on a hill over here. Uh, and it says the other nations will be blessed by that one nation. What a glorious time that will be when there's God's nation that is blessing all the other nations of the world. And the entire world is blessed by God through that people. Genesis 22 has that promise repeated. And so does Genesis 28. Look at Genesis 28 verse 14. He repeats this promise to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, who are known in the Bible as the fathers of the nation of Israel. And Genesis 28, verse 14. This is God appearing to Jacob, the final of those three men whose uh, sons were the fathers of the twelve tribes of Israel. He has twelve sons, and they are the fathers of the twelve tribes. Genesis 28, verse 14. Thy seed shall be as the dust of the earth. Thou shalt spread abroad to the west, to the east, to the north, to the south, and in thee, Jacob... And in thy seed shall all the families of the earth be blessed. Behold, I am with thee, and will keep thee in the places where thou goest, and will bring thee again unto this land. For I will not leave thee until I have done that which I have spoken to thee of. And so he's talking about all the nations of the world. Here's the world being blessed by a nation that will come from Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. Right? This is a theme that you'll see from beginning to end in Scripture. Genesis talks about the promise, and then in Revelation... It talks about the fulfillment, beginning to the end. Okay. Uh, however, look at Genesis 15. Genesis 15. You have the promise over here. You've got the glory that will happen over here in the kingdom of God on earth through this nation. But God tells Abraham something. There's going to be some suffering first. Genesis 15 in verse 13. God said to Abram, Know of a surety that thy seed, thy seed which God promised him, remember, shall be a stranger in a land that is not theirs, 
and shall serve them, and they shall afflict them four hundred years. And also that nation whom they shall serve will I judge, and afterwards shall they come out with great substance. You see that? And it says in verse 16, he's going to die before any of this happens. So this seed, this nation that comes out of you is going to be slaves and serve this other nation, and they're going to be afflicted for hundreds of years. So we have suffering before the glory. And what happens after God judges the nation who afflicts them? They're going to come out with great substance. Right? You remember the story? Uh, go back to Exodus chapter 3. Moving forward 400 years or so, Exodus chapter 3, in verse 6. Israel is a nation of people, and they're all slaves at this point. You know the story? Slaves to the Egyptians under Pharaoh. In Exodus 3, here's Moses, whom God is going to call to save these people from their suffering. Exodus chapter 3, verse 6. This is the story about uh, Mount Horeb. Right? or Mount Sinai, as you would, where uh, Moses comes there and he sees the bush on fire that is not being burnt, the burning bush that isn't consumed. Uh, he walks up to it to see what's going on. He hears a voice that says, Take off your shoes. Uh, this is holy ground in verse 5. Moreover, he said, I am the God of thy father, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look upon God. And the Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people which are in Egypt, and have heard their cry by reason of their taskmasters, for I know their sorrows. I am come down to deliver them in the hand of the Egyptians, and to bring them up out of the land, that land into a good land, and a large, uh, unto a land flowing with milk and honey, unto the place of the Canaanites and the Hittites and the Amorites and these guys. So you're going to have this land I promise to bring you to. Okay. Uh, drop down to verse... Uh, 11, or verse 10 rather, Come now therefore, and I will send thee unto Pharaoh, that thou mayest bring forth my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. Moses said unto God, Who am I, that I should go unto Pharaoh, that I should bring forth the children of Israel out of Egypt? Well, that's a good question, Moses, because he's just one man. But God said, I get a, made a promise to these people, they'd be inhabiting a land to be a blessing. They're suffering now, and he's going to send Moses to deliver them, right? So Moses is the deliverer. People are suffering. God sends the deliverer. He promised glory, and the deliverer gives them glory. You see? So there's glory God promised. Suffering precedes it. A Savior precedes it. There's glory. This pattern you're going to see over and over again in the Scripture of this nation going through suffering. God sends a Savior, and then they have glory afterward. God loves the underdog, apparently, that type of principles throughout the Scripture, right? Um, this is the story of Moses in the Bible. Now, let me draw my second chart. All right. My second chart is with Joseph. Remember the story of Joseph in Genesis? Let's look at Genesis 47. You all know the story of Joseph? I didn't see any head nods. I, mean, I don't know if you learned it in our Sunday school or some other Sunday school, or maybe you read it at home, which would be fine. In Genesis, the story of Joseph, who was one of 12 brothers, right? 12 children, uh, who was sold by his brothers into slavery. Remember this? You know why he was sold into slavery? You say, because of his coat, sort of. He got the coat. Remember, the, he, he got the coat from his father, uh, Jacob, and because he loved Joseph, and he got the multicolored coat and that sort of thing. But I think really the straw that brought the camel's back was when Joseph was given a dream about his family bowing down to him. Remember that? That was it. It's like, fine, you got a coat. That's it. But now you're telling us we're going to bow down to you? And so his brothers conspired to sell him off. <laughs> and they did that, remember. Um, now, so God gave Joseph, here's Joseph over here, this dream that his brothers <laughs> would be bowing down to him. There's Joseph, right? Glory for him, not to his brothers. His brothers sell him. And Joseph gets thrown in prison. He's a slave, right? To the Egyptians, eventually. He's in prison for quite a while. Yeah, and then what happens? Um, he gets delivered. He gets saved. And what's he become? The second command in Egypt. Right? Second command. So Joseph becomes a ruler of Egypt, a prince of Egypt, a king there in Egypt, 
after he goes through suffering. God made him a promise that your brothers will bow down to him. He goes through the suffering. And what is the famous thing Joseph says about what God intended after his brothers come and they reconcile? Remember all that story? The way you intended for evil, God intended for good. Right? And God puts Joseph and delivers him to be this ruler of Egypt. And thus, you know the story as well. Look at Genesis chapter 47. <clears throat> Genesis 47. While Joseph was a ruler in Egypt, the story of the reconciliation is, is so amazing. We covered Genesis verse by verse years ago. And it's amazing how many pictures and types back here you can find of the Lord Jesus Christ and his coming kingdom. Joseph is a type of Jesus Christ. Stephen says so. The New Testament says so. You go back here and read Joseph's life, and you can see how there's at least 100 different types I have listed on the website of things that happened in his life that are shadows or are copies of what Jesus would do or go through. Okay? Um, that sort of, you say, what's a type? What is that? A type is a prophecy of what will happen, but it's not uttered as a prophecy. It's written as history. That's what it is. So I'm telling you a historical story, and the story itself will be a prophecy of what will happen. Right? So like I'm just showing you here, Joseph went through suffering, and he's delivered to be king. I mean, surely you can imagine in your mind what that sounds like. Someone comes, goes through suffering, and is delivered to be the king. That, of course, Jesus Christ goes through that same thing as well. Um, but this is what a type is. Uh, by the way, side note, if you're looking to explain if the Bible is the Word of God or not, prophecy is one of the primary ways we can know that the Bible is the Word of God, and not just outright direct prophecy, like when Isaiah predicts someone's name 100 years in advance or anything like that, or when he predicts the fall of kingdoms centuries before it happens. But prophecies like this, where the people who wrote these stories didn't even know they were prophesying. They're just writing the story. And then the story itself is a prophecy of things to come. You see, the guy who wrote Genesis, Moses, right, wasn't writing this going, this is going to be a prophecy. He's just writing a story of Joseph. But the events that he includes in the story and the details he includes in the story, unknown to him, are actually the same types that will happen in the future. That's, you say, well, th the author didn't know to do that. It also can't be something where this just happens by accident because that's not th the sort of thing that happens because the stories, every detail that's given and some minute details, trivial details, are types. Why did they choose to put those in? You see? There's the book, the Bible is a book that has a unified purpose, you see. And it was written over the span of 1,500 years by 40 different authors. And it wasn't written by committee. And it wasn't written to say, well, what are you going to write? Let's plan this out. Let's draw the plot line here. They didn't do that. They wrote what they wrote for the genre in which they wrote it. And all 66 books come together to tell a single unified story. Right? Who's the editor of this thing? Right? That's the question. Right? How did that happen? Right? You know how hard it is for humans to do anything by committee? <laughs> and we laugh because we know it doesn't happen this way. Okay? And that's one evidence. is types and shadows is a type of prophecy. It's really hard to uh, explain apart from divine inspiration. Anyway, so we have this story, my second chart here of Joseph going through suffering. He's delivered. He becomes the savior, uh, or becomes the king of Egypt and glory there. He also becomes the savior of his own people because when J Joseph is the king of Egypt, he's a ruler in Egypt, uh, his people Israel back home, his father and his son, uh, his brothers, Jacob and, and his sons, are facing famine. Small family over there and uh, they're facing famine. I remember Joseph in the story of, of Egypt as he helped their economics quite a bit over there to help save up during the famine because God told them a famine would happen. And so because God spoke to Joseph, Joseph was able to, to preserve the nation of Egypt. And uh, then when his own people, his brothers and his father, uh, went through this famine, they came to the Egyptians to plead for help, remember? Not knowing that Joseph was the ruler. You know the story, right? And Joseph was able then to save his family. Gabby's shaking her head, no, I don't know the story. <laughs> it's a wonderful story. Yeah, go back to Genesis and, and my Genesis lessons, or read it yourself. But um, uh, Jacob and his sons come to Egypt looking for food during this famine. Joseph, because of God's intervention through him, has been able to supply food to his, the nation of Egypt. And so there's this whole reconciliation where Joseph pretends not to be Joseph. He's the king of Egypt, right? And his brothers are bowing down to him, just like the, the dream was. And uh, Joseph makes it hard for them by, you know, requiring them to, to give up something. You know, their, their beloved youngest brother, which they had learned by this time not to sell off because his father loves him. And so, you know, they bring the, the brother and the father comes with them. And there's a time where Joseph reveals himself as their brother, which is amazing because his brothers thought he was dead. 
and uh, he, he declares himself to be their savior in that I can help you. Of course I'm going to help you. And of course you can move here and you have all the food that you want. And so literally there's a salvation. In Genesis chapter 47 verse 25, uh, this is when he moves Jacob and his brothers to Egypt so they can have plenty there. And it says Genesis 47, 25, Thou hast saved our lives, is what his family said to Joseph. Thou hast saved our lives. Let us find grace in thy sight of my Lord, and we will be Pharaoh's servants. And Joseph made it a law over the land of Egypt unto this day, that Pharaoh should have the fifth part, uh, except the land of the priests only, which became not Pharaoh's. And Israel dwelt in the land of Egypt, in the country of Goshen, and they had possession therein, and grew and multiplied exceedingly. And so again, you have this picture of a kingdom where Israel multiplies and grows exceedingly, at the hand of this Savior, who's Joseph, that saved them from death and famine through this suffering and tribulation. Okay. So, you see the theme of the nation going through suffering, being delivered by a Savior, coming into prosperity in the kingdom, you see in the story of Joseph. Let's see it again. Erase my chart, we'll see it again. I'm trying to show you how the Bible speaks about a nation and prophesies of a glory and almost always talks about a suffering that must occur before this glory happens. Let's think, consider David. Psalm 59. Look at Psalm 59. You know the story of David? You should. David was a shepherd, right? And uh, his brothers were bigger than he was. And Israel was given a promise of God to conquer their, the people in the land that he had promised them. And yet they were too timid to trust God to defeat these huge armies that were inhabiting the land. The Philistines, namely, amongst them their giant Goliath, right? This was their warrior. And uh, David, of course, because he trusts God, goes to King Saul and says, you know, I trust God. We're Israel. He gave us a covenant. Why can't we defeat these guys? And he goes out with a slingshot, hurls the sling at uh, David, knocks him down. Uh, it doesn't kill him. He knocks him down, and he goes and grabs his sword and cuts his head off. Uh, it's an amazing story uh, that David gets the victory for Israel, the Philistines, because he trusts God. And, of course, the moral there is, is, is apparent. Um, but I want to talk about David and as his rise to king. Because David wasn't just the, uh, the, the guy who, who slung the stone. He was the king of Israel. Okay. Uh, and uh, he was the king of Israel at a time when Israel was becoming the, the kingdom of the world, okay? Uh, during his son Solomon's reign, Israel would be a nation more glorious than any other nation on the planet, and nations across the world would come to Israel giving them gifts, right? So we're going to put Solomon over here. Solomon, son of David. Israel was a nation of the land, and the Gentiles brought them gifts. It all started back here with David. King Saul became a wicked king. He was the first king of Israel. David became the second king, but it wasn't without suffering. Uh, in Psalm 57 is where you're at. This is where David, even though he was prophesied upon by, uh, by the prophets that he would be king. And even though God told him that he would be king, uh, Saul would have nothing of it. Saul was the first king of Israel, and this was the part of Saul's downfall and his wickedness, resisting God's command. And uh, Saul tried to kill David. And that was the story of David's life. And so Saul would send his armies out to, to slaughter David because if he's going to be king, I don't want him to be king, we need to kill him. And so in Psalm 27 at the beginning there, you, you read the introduction that says, to the chief musician, uh, Miktam of David, when he fled from Saul in the cave. Before David was king, he was a shepherd. Before he was king, he was hiding in caves, right? Running for his life. And David writes this psalm, Be merciful unto me, O God, be merciful unto me, for my soul trusts in thee. Yea, in the shadow of thy wings will I make my refuge until these calamities be overpassed. What calamities? He's running for his life. We call that suffering? That's what I call that, running for your life. Okay, he's, he's threatened to be killed. Uh, verse 2, I will cry unto God most high, unto God that performs all things for me. He shall send from heaven and save me from the reproach of him that would swallow me up. What's going to happen? He's going through suffering, but God will save him. Save your God. Right? So that he can be delivered. Right? He can be the king whom God made him to be. In verse 4, my soul is among lions. I lie even among them that are set on fire. Even this, by the way, verse 4, there's a prophecy of Daniel. In case you didn't hear that so blatantly in there. 
But he says, My soul is among lions. I lay even among them that are set on fire, even the sons of men, whose teeth are spears and arrows, and their tongue a sharp sword. Be thou exalted, O God, above the heavens. Let thy glory be above all the earth. And so you see here, even during his suffering, he's praising God, and he trusts him to save him from this suffering and deliver him so that he would sit on the throne as God said he would. Right? So God makes this glorious promise of David's reign. David around him sees calamities and suffering running for his life. How does David know it's going to come true? This is God's promise, and he trusts God's promise. It's faith, right? God told David while he was king that there'd be a son that is on the throne forever from your house. Right? These promises God made to him. Look at Psalm 59 in verse 1. The introduction of this psalm says to the chief musician, Miktam of David, when Saul sent and they watched the house to kill him. <laughs> Not a good day. Deliver me from mine enemies, O my God. Defend me from them that rise up against me. Deliver me from the workers of iniquity and save me from bloody men. For lo, they lie in wait for my soul. The mighty are gathered against me. This is not metaphorical, folks. I'm not going to take this out of context and say, you've got enemies in your life. you got tax collectors and people at work and you got people that are against you. They're not waiting at your house to kill you. Okay? They were David. That's what he's talking about. In verse 4, it says, They run, prepare themselves without my fault. Awake to help me, and behold, thou therefore, O Lord God of hosts, the God of Israel, awake to visit all the heathen. Be not merciful to any wicked transgressors. And he goes on to talk about his trust in Savior God. He knows he can save, God can save him. But he's going through suffering right now. Right? He's got this hope of glory, is what he's got a hope of. Look at Psalm chapter 22. I'm giving you some context here about the Psalms. David writes Psalms when he's in trouble asking for God's help. There's other Psalms he writes praising God for when he delivers him. Psalm 22. See if this sounds familiar. This is another Psalm of David when he wrote when he was in calamities and suffering. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Wait a minute. Did David say that? Sure did. In Psalm 22. Now you're more familiar possibly with the other guy that said this. It was Jesus, but we're not there yet. Verse 2 says, O oh my God, I cry in the daytime, but thou hearest not, and in the night season, and am not silent. But thou art holy, O thou that inhabitest the praises of Israel. Our fathers trusted in thee, they trusted, and thou didst deliver them. They cried unto thee, and were delivered. They trusted in thee, were not confounded. But I am a worm, and no man, a reproach of men, despised of the people. I'm going through suffering. All they that see me laugh me to scorn. They shoot out the lip. They shake the head, saying, He trusted on the Lord that he would deliver him. Let him deliver him, seeth he delighted in him. But thou art he that took me out of the womb, who did make me uh, hope when I was upon my mother's breasts. I was cast upon thee from the womb. Thou art my God from my mother's belly. Be not far from me. And he goes on to ask for salvation from this distress from God. Right? Suffering, God sends salvation, glory to come. Right? And then by that glory, by the way, is him being king. It's a nation, him being a king. Okay? Let's try it again. This wasn't a good enough chart, you say. Okay, let me try another one. This, this theme of God's chosen people being a nation to bless the other nations and rising up his people to be a glory of the world, but first going through suffering is repeatedly a theme in prophecy. Okay? Isaiah, for example. Look at Isaiah 44. We're studying Isaiah chapter by chapter on Tuesdays. In Isaiah 44, verse 28. Isaiah is prophesying as part of a remnant of Israel. He's prophesying later in Israel's history, after David was king, after Solomon, after the nation was split, after Israel's been a kingdom for quite a while, and yet the kingdom is on decline because they're disobeying God's covenant. And so Isaiah is prophesying uh, about Israel and how God's going to send enemies to conquer you because you disobeyed his covenant. But because he promised you would exist forever as a people and that he would give you a kingdom and be a nation above the other nations, he's going to bring punishment and then save you and deliver you out of that and bring you back into your kingdom and your land. And that's what Isaiah prophesies. It's a prophecy called the remnant of Israel, where there's going to be punishment among those who transgress God's covenant. There's going to be suffering. And then out of that suffering... God's going to send a Savior who will deliver them back into the land to be once again a people. All right, this remnant will return. This is Isaiah's prophecy. Isaiah 44, verse 28. Here's where Isaiah makes the prophecy about who that Savior would be. You say, well, I know it's Jesus. 
it says, that saith of Cyrus, he is my shepherd and shall perform all my pleasure, even saying to Jerusalem, thou shalt be built, and to the temple thy foundation shall be laid. Thus saith the Lord, chapter 45, verse 1, to his anointed, to Cyrus, whose right hand have I holden to subdue nations before him, I will loose the loins of kings to open before him the two-leaved gates, and the gates shall not be shut. I will go before thee and make the crooked places straight. I will break in pieces the gates of brass and cut in sunder the bars of iron. He's going to have power to destroy nations, conquer nations, so that Israel and their temple and their nation will be rebuilt. That's what he's prophesying here. Okay. Cyrus, who was a, a ruler of Persia, the Persian Empire. Okay. You say, well, so what? Isaiah lived two empires prior to the Persian Empire. Isaiah lived in a day when the Assyrian Empire was the threat. The Assyrian Empire would eventually fall after Isaiah dies to the Babylonian Empire, who would eventually fall to the Persian Empire. And Cyrus was the guy at the Persian Empire that destroyed the Babylonian Empire for their downfall. And Isaiah prophesies more than 100 years before the guy is even born his name, and he will be the savior of this remnant of Israel who's taken captive into Babylon after the suffering they go through. And as captives, he will say, you captives are free. Go back to Jerusalem and build your temple and build your nation, according to God's promises. Amazing prophecy. How do you explain that? And here's how unbelievers do. Well, obviously, it was written after the fact. There's no evidence for that. There's every evidence to the contrary, right? That's the only explanation you can have if it's not true, and that's your premise. Otherwise, how do you explain that? And this isn't the only prophecy like this. We've covered many of them on our Tuesday lessons where he prophesies things that will happen politically down the road centuries before it occurs. Okay, meanwhile, you see the theme once again. Isaiah prophesies a nation going through suffering, a remnant nation, who will then be delivered by a savior, in this case Cyrus, who comes back to the land to be a nation who will eventually bless the nations. Right? This nation's a big deal with God apparently in the Bible. I mean, it's like this, this nation won't go away. Famines, empires, I mean, this will not go away. It just persists. Because God promised Abraham, remember, that be a nation above the nations. A theme throughout the scripture. In Revelation, you see these names come up again. You see the prophecies Isaiah spoke about come up in Revelation. You see Israel return in Revelation. You see a Savior in Revelation. And you see the glory of Israel in Revelation 20 and 21. Right? This is what the Bible talks about from beginning to end. The nation of Israel. Right? A promised nation and kingdom. Is it getting old yet? Let's look at John the Baptist. In Matthew chapter 3, John the Baptist comes, uh, we're turning to Mark, Mark chapter 1. Mark chapter 1, in verse 2. <clears throat> As it is written in the prophets, Behold, I send my messenger before thy face, which shall prepare thy way before thee. Does anyone know which prophet that is in verse 2? The right answer is Malachi. It's Malachi. And that's so important because it says prophets in verse 2, not Isaiah. You say, why would it say Isaiah? I don't know. <laughs> You're being silly, Justin. Well, other Bible translations put Isaiah there. They put Isaiah there. It's not because they don't know how to translate. It's because they're translating from different Greek texts than the one from the King James Bible. And they put Isaiah in Mark 1, verse 2. And it's wrong because verse 2 is Malachi, not Isaiah. It's an actual mistake in a Bible translation. Like, not a translation mistake, just a mistake. It's a problem. Like, the Bible is wrong. Right? Not the translator, but the Bible. That's an issue. Your King James Bible says it's written in the prophets. He quotes Malachi in verse 2, then he quotes Isaiah in verse 3. I, I will send my messenger before thy face, prepare thy way before thee, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his path straight. John did baptize in the wilderness. This is John the Baptist. And he talks about Jesus coming. A king. A savior. Erase Isaiah here. And we'll put John the Baptist. Okay who was preaching about a kingdom come. In Mark chapter 1, down in verse 14, it says, After John was put in prison, Jesus came to Galilee, preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God. You know what the gospel of the kingdom is? It's the same message we've been preaching over and over again this morning. From Moses to David to Joseph, all the prophets spoke about the gospel of the kingdom. God promised Israel would be a nation to bless the whole world, and God will bless the world through them. And you see it over and over again. And here it is again with John the Baptist and Jesus, preaching the gospel of the kingdom, which is, the time is fulfilled, the kingdom of God is at hand, repent ye and believe. 
right? Apparently they're saying the kingdom is ready to come. The kingdom he promised to Abraham, the kingdom of which the world will be blessed through them, is at hand, right? And who's going to bring it? Jesus will be the Savior, right? But we're not done yet. What did Jesus say would happen first? Look at Matthew 24. Before the kingdom come, what would happen? It says down in verse 9. Then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted and shall kill you. And you uh, excuse me, what? We just kind of jumped in the conversation here. Jesus is talking to his disciples saying, when will these things come to pass? You know, these days you're talking about kingdom and all that business. Well, they're going to afflict you and try to kill you first. What? I got water baptized. I thought I'd just go to church on Sundays and listen to the kids choir. You're going to be afflicted and they're going to try to kill you first. They should be hated of all nations for my name's sake. I thought we were going to be blessed to the nations. Not that they're going to bring us gifts. I mean, you're going to be hated of all nations. Before the glory, right, comes what? You know the answer, right? You're all theologians. Suffering. Right? Before the glory comes the suffering. And this is what Jesus is going to say. In verse 10, they shall be many, uh, then shall many be offended. They shall betray one another. shall hate one another. And many false prophets shall rise, shall deceive many. And because iniquity shall abound. Iniquity, sin, not good. Inequity, injustice. Inequity, that's what that word is. The love of many shall wax cold, but he that shall endure to the end shall be saved. The end of what? Suffering. Right? It says, And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. Okay? You drop down to verse 29. It says, Immediately after the tribulation of those days, after the tribulation of those days, the sun shall be darkened, the moon shall not give her light, the stars shall fall from heaven, the powers of heaven shall be shaken, and then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, and all the tribes of the earth shall mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. Who comes before the glory? The Savior. What happens before the Savior comes? Suffering. That's not new. Is this a mystery at all? No, this was spoken of by the prophets ever since the world began. Not new information at all in Matthew 24, is it? What's the Bible talk about? Well, it talks about a nation pretty much throughout the whole thing. Like the promise of a kingdom on earth and glory for all people and this sort of thing from God. It talks about suffering happening first and who's going to send a savior. And pretty much every story is the same type of theme. So much so that people who study that sort of thing, plot lines, are getting tired of it. They call it the Christian theme. It's like, of course, suffering, savior, redemption. Like, it's so cliche, and they still use it because it still works. But anyway, this is the story in the scripture, and it's, it's repeated over and over again. You've got to suffer before the glory. The second theme in the Bible is not just a nation, but it's about Jesus Christ. It's a man, Jesus Christ, a God man. The Old Testament speaks to the suffering of a people, a Savior, King, and a Messiah who would come to deliver them, whether it be Moses or Joseph or David or Jesus. And it talks about the glorious kingdom that will come later. But also the Bible speaks about Jesus Christ specifically. Okay. The New Testament speaks about the birth and life of Jesus Christ uh, who died never bringing the kingdom. You know what the New Testament talks about? What's the story of the New Testament? Jesus came. He lived. He died. Kingdom never came. What? Well, Revelation has the kingdom. Well, has that happened or not? Some people, Christians, are divided. They'll say, well, it already happened. Wait a minute. So, you mean all that glory God promised, we're living in it? And maybe on good days, you're like, all right. But on most days, you're like, mm, Bible's not true. Right? That's how people get there. How can it be true? What it said didn't happen. Well, some of it. What it said it doesn't happen yet is the idea. But the Bible speaks about Jesus in the Old Testament and the New. In John 5, 39, Jesus says when he was preaching on earth, Search the scriptures. Why? They speak of Israel, the nation, and the kingdoms. He says they speak of me. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. I thought God made a promise to Abraham to have a seed. Oh, right. He gave a promise to Abraham to have a seed. And that seed would be a blessing to the nations. Right? I thought the story is about Joseph being king. Joseph who suffered and then gave his life for his brothers. Oh, right. Maybe it is talking about Jesus. 
Oh, the story was Moses, a, a, a baby abandoned, who became a deliverer of people. Oh, maybe that's talking about Jesus, right? So you start reviewing the Old Testament in light of this statement. Jesus says, search the scriptures. They speak of me. And you're going, maybe they do. And you're going back and you're reading and going, he's everywhere. So there are Christians read the Bible in that way. And they go, I see Jesus on every page. And they're right. The Bible speaks about Jesus on every page. The revelation from God. Jesus is called the Word. The Word revealed from God. This is the Bible. It's also Jesus. There's a lot of similarities in that regard. In Matthew chapter 3, verse 15, when Jesus came to be baptized to John the Baptist, that wasn't like him being ordained and saying, I need to get signed up to do ministry here. I'm going to be the greatest minister ever. Uh, Jesus came to John the Baptist, who was preaching repentance for the remission of sins. He's saying, get water baptized so that your sins can be forgiven. Right? And uh, John the Baptist stops his ministry right there and says, I don't need to baptize you. Do you know this, this part of the story, Matthew 3? He says, I need to be baptized of you, Jesus. Not the other way around. Because John knew he was a sinner. And he knew that his cousin was sinless. The son of God. All right? Because God told him, by the way. He didn't just look at him on the outside or something like that. He wasn't comely really to look at. He, he knew because God told him. In John 1, he tells the story of that. But Jesus says, no, no, no. He says, you need to baptize me to fulfill all righteousness. Because I need to take the place of sinners. So you baptize me as a sinner because that's what I'm going to do. That's why Jesus was baptiz baptized. To take the place of sinners. And that's why you can't follow Jesus in baptism. It's the same reason why you can't follow Jesus by dying on the cross for your own sins. Can't do it. Right? Doesn't make any sense to follow Jesus in baptism. He, ba he was baptized unlike anyone else in the Bible, in history. Okay? But he said, I came to fulfill all righteousness. He came to fulfill that which was spoken of, uh, written of before about him. Look at Matthew 5, 17. Matthew 5, verse 17. Jesus came and taught, and he says, Think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. He came to fulfill all that was written in the laws and the Psalms and the prophets about him. Look at Luke 24. <clears throat> 24, verse 44. After his death and resurrection, Jesus appears to his disciples. After they had a little breakfast there, he says in verse 44, These are the words which I spake unto you while I was yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses and in the prophets and in the Psalms concerning me. He opened the, he their understanding that they might understand the scriptures. If it was written in the law and the Psalms and the prophets, was it kept secret? It was revealed by God in the scriptures. It was recorded. And what was revealed in the scriptures, Deuteronomy says, is not a mystery. It's been revealed for them to know. They didn't know it. So he's telling them, it's written about me. Let me show you. Turn back here to the, the scriptures and I'll show you how it was. You know the story of Joseph? Me. Story of Moses? Me. Story of David? Me. Who's greater than Solomon? Me. Right? Like every story in the Old Testament, he's like, type of me, type of me, shadow of me, points to me. It's me. Hello. I'm God. I'm Savior. Right? That's what he's pointing to. Every, every story in the Old Testament. Okay? I was there in the fiery furnace with the three boys, three, the three men who stood in the fire. And he sees a fourth man there. Right? Nebuchadnezzar sees a fourth man, and he says, who's that fourth guy? He's like the son of man. Yeah. He's like the son of God. That's it's, uh, Jesus back there. Pure incarnate Jesus. Anyway, he says, it's all sp it's speaking about me, and I'll, I'll show you that. I am your Savior. I'm your Messiah. Right? Cyrus, shadow type of me. I will bring Israel back into the land. Okay? Look at Luke 18, verse 31. What's the Bible talk about? A nation of glory and suffering to precede it. A nation, a kingdom on the earth, of glo God's glory on the earth, also about Jesus Christ. Every page is about Jesus Christ. Luke 18, verse 31. Then he took unto him the twelve and said unto them, Behold, we go up to Jerusalem, and all things that are written by the prophets concerning the Son of Man shall be accomplished. Seems consistent from what he said before. This is what's going to be accomplished. He shall be delivered unto the Gentiles, shall be mocked, spitefully entreated, spitted on. They shall scourge him, put him to death. The third day he shall rise again. Right? Wait a minute. Let's, well, I'm going to put this up here. But we're going to put uh, Jesus over here. Jesus says, I'm going to fill the prophecies. Okay? What's going to happen? He's going to be mocked, 
spitefully entreated, spit it on, scourged. Is that a good day? That's suffering, right? Are you with me? I got to go through suffering. They said, you're the king, Jesus. You're the king. Glory, right? I got to go through suffering first. That's what he said. That's what he to told Peter. That's what he told Israel. He opened the scripture to show them that it was so. He said, it, it, it had to be that I suffered. It had to be that I died. The scriptures say so. Okay. Look at 1 Peter 1 verse 11. Peter speaks of this after Jesus taught him about what the scriptures said about him. Peter writes in 1 Peter 1 verse 11. Verse 10 rather. 1 Peter 1 verse 10. Of which salvation the prophets have inquired and searched diligently who prophesied of the grace that should come unto you, searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ which was in them did signify. Let me summarize real quick. He's talking about salvation that was written about in the prophets. Salvation, written of in the prophets, right? And the prophets, who it says in verse 11, had the Spirit of Christ in them, which Peter now knows, because back there it was just God talking to them, and now he knows that was, you know, the Spirit of Christ talking to them, right? And what were they talking about? which was in them did signify when it testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glory that should follow. Right? In fact, Jesus himself suffered, rose from the dead, right? Suffered up there to be glorified. Bring back the kingdom. Right? Look at 1 Peter 1 verse 3. After Jesus died, after he went through that suffering, which Peter tried to stop. Remember Peter tried to stop it? He told Peter, I got to go suffer and die. And Peter says, not so, Lord, and Jesus rebukes him sternly. Remember? Get thee behind me, Satan. Why does Jesus want to go through suffering? But the prophet spoke about it. It has to happen. The prophet said it had to occur. Right? Peter tried to stop it. Peter's the one that trailed Jesus when he was taking a trial, remember? And of course, he denied him thrice, three times. But at least he was following him. Where are the other disciples at? Right? He's over there. You know, seeing what he can do to get him free. Maybe he can steal a key or something, you know, find him out. Never happens. He's on the cross dying. And uh, 1 Peter 1, verse 3, his disciples don't know why he died. Remember? When he died, they weren't sitting around counting the hours. Three days. Let's see how long that's going to be. Obviously, 24. Good Friday, right? No. <laughs> three days and three nights. They weren't counting the hours because they didn't understand. And John 20, it even says they didn't know that he needed to rise from the dead. They didn't know the scriptures spoke about him when they spoke about his suffering and then the glory that should follow his suffering. They thought when the Messiah and the Savior came, they thought, whoa, I thought when the Savior came, glory would follow. Why would they think that? As the scriptures said, when the Savior came, glory would follow. And when Jesus came, he was the Savior, they thought glory would follow. The problem was the Savior came here and the Savior will come again, right? You've heard this before, this is not news, but he would come twice to Israel. He came the first time, not for glory, he came the first time to suffer. And Jesus explains, I have to suffer first, then the glory. Oh, okay, so the suffer first, and then you're going to return and bring glory. Yeah, that was the whole ministry of Jesus to his disciples. I've come to suffer, and they didn't believe it, because I'm going to go and then come back and bring the kingdom. See, that was the ministry of Jesus in the second half of his ministry there. 1 Peter 1, verse 3, so when Jesus rose from the dead here, when, his, when the disciples said, we don't understand why you died, them seeing Jesus alive was a rejoicing for them. But it wasn't rejoicing in the same way you and I rejoice, knowing what happened with the resurrection. We'll cover that in a little bit. They were rejoicing because you cannot have glory in the kingdom without the Savior, without the King. And if the King dies, how are you going to have a kingdom? The story in the New Testament, Jesus came, lived, He died, He went to heaven, the kingdom didn't happen. Right? It's like it didn't feel fulfilled. But if he didn't rise from the dead, there's no hope for a kingdom, folks. If he's just dead like Muhammad or something, there's no hope of a kingdom. Right? But he didn't just stay dead. He rose from the dead, which Peter writes, gives him a renewed, a lively hope. A lively hope of a kingdom. Verse 3 of 1 Peter 1. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us again. That's being born again, right? Begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. And so you see Peter's preaching resurrection. Yeah, as a renewal of their hope in what? Look at verse 4. To an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you, 
See, well, he's, he's got hope in heaven. It's reserved in heaven. It's going to come down in verse 5. Who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. When does salvation come for Peter? Here's Jesus suffering. Here, here Peter is right here in, in, in history. He's after his resurrection, before the kingdom. And Peter says salvation will come in the last time when he returns before the kingdom. That's when salvation is going to come. First, read First Peter. He says, wait to the end. He's going to bring salvation. He says, I know, Jesus taught me. <laughs> he had to suffer. He had to go to heaven. He's going to come back with salvation. So wait for that. And we have a hope because he's alive. I saw him ascend to heaven. All right, he's going to return. Look at Hebrews chapter 2. Hebrews chapter 2. Hebrews 2 verse 9. Author of Hebrews, speaking to the Hebrew apostles, the Hebrew believers, Jesus' uh, disciples there, says, We see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death. See? Jesus became man, went through suffering, the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he might be the grace of God, should taste death for every man. For, for it became him, for whom are all things, and by whom are all things, bringing many sons into glory, to, the, to make the captain of their salvation perfect, through sufferings. See, salvation can be made perfect through Jesus' suffering and his bringing in the kingdom. Look at Hebrews chapter 9. You see it again here in verse 28. Hebrews 9 28. Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many. When did that happen? He suffered. He suffered to bear the sins. Like, sinners deserve suffering, sinners deserve judgment. Jesus didn't. He suffered to bear the sins of many. Uh, and unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. Has the second half of that verse happened yet? No. So see that Hebrews is written right here. He suffered for sins. He's gone to heaven. Hebrews talks about that. And we're looking for him to come the second time unto salvation. To save us into that kingdom. Right? Hebrews 13 talks about wait for a city, a city to come. Okay? So the scripture speaks about Jesus. Jesus is the one that goes through suffering. Jesus is the Savior that will return, and Jesus is the one that brings kingdom glory. Jesus. Right? Well, all the scripture talks about it. That's why that theme of prophecy of suffering and Savior and glory fits right in with Jesus. That's what he came to do for them. Let's talk about something else. Look at Romans chapter 8, verse 18. Then you get Paul's epistles. Now, now, what I just said so far is what most people understand in churches about the Bible. They say, yep, we understand the whole suffering, glory, kingdom bit. We understand that I was speaking about Jesus. And most of them stop there. They say, well, see, that's the end of it. Uh, it talked about kingdom and nations, but really that was just uh, talking about Jesus. That's it. End of story. What about the promises to Israel? Well, they're fulfilled in Jesus. This is a comment, right? Dispensationalists would say, well, no, they weren't fulfilled in Jesus. Um, Israel will return to keep the promises literally, which would seem to make sense and glorify God in the fact that it's not only talking about Jesus, but also fulfillment of His promises for the earth and Israel. Both, right? Then here we come along and say, hello, there's a third thing. A third thing? Yeah, there's like Old Testament, which is Israel. There's New Testament, which is Jesus fulfilling the Scriptures written to Israel. Then there's mystery, which is the mystery of Christ, which was not spoken by any of the prophets, which is Jesus um, revealing something New. It's like, well, that's interesting. Look at Romans 8.18. Paul talks about suffering and glory. There are three times in the New Testament suffering and glory show up. We've covered one in 1 Peter. We've covered another one in Hebrews. And here's the third time in Romans 8.18. For I reckon the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that shall be revealed in... What? What's the last word? Us. Excuse me, what? Well... We're going to put Jesus here again. There's going to be suffering, right? There's going to be glory, but it's no longer a nation? What, is, what are we doing here? <laughs> We're erasing the nation. What is this glory? This glory is in, how do we draw us? Like this? It's in us? That's interesting. So what's the suffering? Are you dying on a cross? No. Um, it's your life. 
you are suffering? Who's the Savior? Uh, uh, this is getting a little confusing here, isn't it? This doesn't match the pattern. Exactly. They're still suffering. There's still glory. And the glory comes after the suffering. Right? It's not worthy to be compared. Okay, that makes sense. But what is the glory? Who are suffering? What is their salvation? Right? Look at Philippians 1.29. Paul talks about suffering here again. Just trying to get the chart right, that's all. Trying to get the, what the Bible says. And we can stop just five minutes ago and everyone's going, yeah, the Bible says the same thing throughout. It does until you get to Paul. And then there's this revelation of the mystery, which we'll see in a moment accords with prophecy, but it's a different thing. Philippians 1 verse 29, Unto you it is given, on the behalf of Christ, not only to believe on Him, but to suffer for His sake. Excuse me, what? I thought Jesus suffered for our sake. Isn't that what Peter said? No, what Jesus said? He came to suffer for the, the sins of any. Paul says, it's given to you to suffer for Christ. Me, suffer for Him. Okay, why am I doing that? I mean, I don't understand the suffering part, but I thought the whole principle of Jesus was that He suffered for us. Well, of course, that's true. Look at 2 Timothy 3, verse 12. Hopefully you get the, the, the inkling here. When Paul talks about suffering, he is not talking about uh, your salvation. Suffering is not a requirement for your salvation. Okay, 2 Timothy 3, verse 12. It says, All that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. There it is, suffering again. For who? All that will live godly. Because there's an evil in this world, a present evil world. And if you're going to live godly, it's going to be contrary to this world. You're going to face suffering and persecution because you're contrary to the world. Right? That's all that live godly. It doesn't say here, like, if you're just God's people, you're going to suffer. That's the prophecy. If you're God's people, you're going to suffer. Which explains why, since it's not that, some days you have are good. You're going, this doesn't seem like suffering to me. Right? And some days are bad. But see, it was prophesied. Israel, the whole nation, were slaves. Right? The whole nation would go through the tribulation. Right? Jesus suffered on a cross. There wasn't like relief there, you say. But then it comes to us in the church today, in the body of Christ, and it says, um, you're going to suffer for him, and all that live God will suffer persecution. It's a different way of talking about it. He talks about salvation differently. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 1. 2 Corinthians chapter 1. Paul doesn't talk about salvation to come in a future kingdom. He talks about salvation already accomplished. Hmm. You are saved in Christ. That's the starting point, isn't it? You're a sinner, obviously. You believe the gospel of Christ died for your sins and rose from the dead. You trust this, and Paul says you are saved <clears throat> in Christ, and all who live godly will suffer persecution. The Savior doesn't belong there. It's over here, right? He saved you here. You are saved. You might suffer, right? And there's a glory that shall be revealed in you. Uh, in, where was 2 Corinthians chapter 1? <clears throat> Paul calls what he was given a dispensation of the grace of God, a revelation of the mystery, kept secret since the world began. In 2 Corinthians chapter 1, he talks about suffering in verse uh, 5, where he says, As the sufferings of Christ abound in us, so our consolation also abounds by Christ. Will it be afflicted? Is for your consolation and salvation, which is the effects from the enduring of the same sufferings, which we also suffer. Or whether we be comforted, it is for your consolation and salvation. Paul is saying, I am saved in Christ. I have a gospel to minister to you. And if I suffer, it's for your salvation. If I don't suffer, it's for your salvation. Either way, I'm here to help you get saved. Isn't that what Paul's saying? That's interesting. That's kind of egotistical, isn't it? I mean, why doesn't Paul teach, one day Jesus will save you when he comes with his kingdom? That's what Peter said. That's what the prophet said. That's what Jesus said in his earthly ministry. But Paul's talking about a grace gospel about you being saved right now. And you may face suffering if you, if you live godly. You may not. Either way, we're to preach salvation to the others. Salvation based on what? 
in 1 Corinthians 15, it's saved by the death of Jesus Christ for your sins and by his resurrection. Which is to say, when Paul talks about salvation, he says that Christ was the mediator for all, okay, that all might be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. Right? He's not talking about just Israel's salvation. He's talking about the salvation of all and coming to a knowledge of a truth that's, be, that's already been revealed. In Paul's um, telling of things, suffering is not this. Okay? Let me show you. The suffering that Paul talks about is because of what? Hmm? Did someone say it? It's, well, yeah, but it's because of this world, right? It's because of sin. I mean, you share in the gospel, but you get suffering because there's sinners in the world, there's corruption in the world. Suffering is because of sin. Romans 3.10, there's none righteous. All are lost, right? You count them all in unbelief. The suffering is a result of sin. This present world, he says, nothing compares to glory, it shall be revealed. The sufferings you go through now, the sufferings of what? In this present evil world. If we weren't in this world of sin, if there wasn't sin around us, if there wasn't sin everywhere, we wouldn't go through the suffering. Okay? It's sin is what Paul talks about. Romans 5.12, it's by one man sin entered and death by sin. That's why we all die. Romans 5.12, sin is the problem. Right? And what is the solution? What is the Savior in Paul's teaching? What brings the glory? Jesus Christ. Right? So I, I drew salvation over there. But what Paul does is glories in the cross of Jesus Christ. Okay? 1 Corinthians 1.18, what was a preaching of suffering, which is what it was. I mean, there's no other way to explain a cross. I mean, how, how do you die by crucifixion? Pain and suffering. And Paul says, we preach the cross to save you. Excuse me? You preach what Jesus suffered to save me? Yeah. And he says, that's why it's, fool, it's seen as foolishness to people. In Ephesians 2.16, he says, by that cross, you're reconciled to God. In Colossians chapter 1, he says, by the cross, he reconciled all things. In Colossians 2, 14, it's by the cross, he nailed the ordinances that were against you by that cross, right? So Paul starts to explain what happened when Jesus went through that suffering. Those nails, we're just nailing his flesh and bones there. Those nails were nailing the ordinances against you there. They were nailing all the things against you, all your enemies, all of the sins were against you were nailed there. And so in Galatians 6, 14, Paul says, I glory. In Galatians 3, Paul says Christ was made a curse for us on that tree. And he says, God forbid that I glory, save in the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. So we start to preach and celebrate the cross. Don't we? We celebrate the cross. Now, you wouldn't do that in Matthew, Luke, and John. God didn't tell you to do that. God hadn't revealed what he had, will have done yet. And so for them to celebrate Jesus, yay, it would have been a wrong thing to do at the cross. But now that we know, according to the revelation of the mystery given to the Apostle Paul, that what he did by that cross, and he did it on purpose, and he did it to create what Paul calls a new creature, the body of Christ, we glory in that cross. Right? Paul even says in Philippians 3 that he counts all things but lost for the excellency of the knowledge of Jesus Christ, that I may partake of the fellowship of his sufferings and the power of his resurrection. Right? Like, he wants Christ and his cross. That's his glory. Right? That's a different orientation, isn't it? Different orientation. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 8. The cross is no longer the suffering that has to be gone through, the tribulation has to be gone through before the kingdom. Now the cross is the glory. And the sin is what kept us from that. But when Jesus died, now we can have glory. And he rose from the dead, we can have glory. 1 Corinthians 2, verse 8, it says, verse 7, says, We speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the world into our glory. So what's ordained to our glory? The wisdom of God in a mystery, which none of the princes of this world knew, for had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. Jesus was the Lord of glory, not only because he will bring a kingdom of glory, but because of what he did on the cross. In, in the message of the church today, the cross is the glory of God, the death and resurrection of Christ. That's the mystery, the hidden wisdom. If that was known, that that was the end game, was his death on the cross for the world to create this new creature, they would never have killed him because they were trying to make him suffer and suffer loss. And yet God in his purpose gained all through that cross. You see, it was his glory. And by gaining all, I mean he created a new creature. In Ephesians 1, verse 6, look what it says here. 
it's called a new creature because it's not the old thing. The old thing was a nation and a kingdom on the earth. The new thing is not confined to the earth. The new thing inhabits heavenly positions. It's a universal kingdom. It's not confined to one people and nation who has a tribal lineage back to Abraham. It's open to the entire world, no matter your heritage. There's no Jew or Gentile, right? This is the information. Where do we go to Ephesians chapter 1? Ephesians 1 verse 6. It says, God, who predestinated us into the adoption of children by Jesus Christ, is, it says, to the praise of the glory of his grace, wherein he hath made us accepted in the beloved, in whom we have redemption through his blood. The praise of the glory of God is found in those that are redeemed by the blood of Jesus Christ. In Ephesians chapter 1, verse 12 says, that we should be to the praise of his glory who first trusted in Christ. What are you trusting in verse 13? The gospel of your salvation. What's that? Christ died for your sins and rose from the dead. And when that occurs and someone gets saved by God's gracious work there, that's to the praise of God's grace. That's the glory of God. How do I glorify God? Be saved by trusting the gospel. Right? That's how you glorify God today. In Ephesians 1 verse 12. And then you're sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise in verse 13. Okay? That's a glory to God. In Ephesians chapter 3, verse, eight, uh, verse 13, look what Paul says. Ephesians 3, 13. Of course, Ephesians 3 talks about this revelation of the mystery given to Paul, the fellowship of the mystery of Christ. Verse 13 says, I desire that you faint not at my tribulations for you, which is your glory. You see? Paul tells them not to faint at his tribulations for them. Why? Paul's going through troubles. He's going through troubles because he's ministering to the Ephesians. They're worried about him. He goes, no, no, don't. I'm doing it for you. Do you see how that's... He, got, he didn't invent that. Jesus did. Jesus told him that. When Christians are going, oh, he suffered so much at that cross. That must have really hurt. What do you think Jesus' response would be in this dispensation of grace? It might sound a lot like Paul. Don't thank you at my tribulations. Right? He says, it's for you. It's for your glory. Right? You glory in what I did for you. Don't you dare have a pity party for what I did, Jesus says. He says, you glory in what I did. Galatians 6, 14. Verse 7, it says, unto every one of us is given grace according to the measure. Or I'm in the wrong chapter. Verse, uh, verse 14, Ephesians 3, 14. For this cause I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might by his spirit in the inner man. Go on, goes on to talk about the fullness of God, the glory that we have as a result of his death and resurrection. Okay. This is the glory of the mystery. In 2 Corinthians 4, it's about the glorious gospel of the mystery of Christ. Colossians 1, 27 talks about the hope of glory you have according to the mystery, which is you in Christ and Christ in you, right? We glory in the cross, right? The suffering we have is our life after our salvation. It's sin that's around us, okay? But we are saved by Christ now, and that's to our glory, that we can say we have a fellowship with him in his sufferings. That we have a fellowship with him in his resurrection and glory. When Jesus, according to prophecy, came to Israel, he came to deliver them out of their sufferings to bring their kingdom glory. He came to his people to deliver them. Right? According to the mystery, the way God sees the world now is that Israel has fallen, they're all in unbelief, they're all sinners that need help, and he commences love that while we were all yet sinners, he died for us. And that's to his glory, right? It's not that Jesus in this dispensation came to his people. He did that once. He came to his own, his own received him not. In this dispensation, Jesus is preached to a world that's rejected him. But he's not coming to his people, okay? Jesus is preached to create a people today, Right? The preaching of Jesus Christ according to the mystery is not that he's the king that will come to his nation and build up that kingdom. It's that he's the head that's trying to grow his body. Right? You can't have a, a king unless you have a kingdom for him to king over first. Right? A people, a nation, a seed, fathers, laws. Right? But I tell you what, ask your mama. The head is born first. Right? In the body. And you have the head of the body who's there first and the body is built. And that's what happens in this dispensation. Jesus creates a people today. That's why he calls it a new creature. Okay? 
And so you have in the Bible three themes. We have prophecy, which God speaks about suffering and the glory should follow. We have Jesus Christ who fulfills the suffering and the glory should follow in the kingdom. And then you have Paul that kind of turns that on its head, but it's speaking about the same thing. Jesus is still went through suffering. He still gives you glory, but instead we glory in his suffering. We glory in the cross. We take part in this new creature that he's creating that will preach his grace, right? So this is what God's doing today. It's called a mystery. And it's, it's about his body. God's nation, God's son, God's body. This is what the Bible talks about, right? This is my chart lessons today. Any comments, any questions about, about that?